Greetings, folks. It's Professor Fiori back once again. Today, we're going to talk about simple harmonic motion. In other words, something that creates a sinusoidal waveform. Essentially, these are resonance systems, and they sort of pick out a specific frequency. It's what we, what we call the natural resonant frequency. The system is in balance and wants to I use wants in sort of quotes here because it's an inanimate object that doesn't want anything, but we sort of think of it that way. We anthropomorphize it as wanting to vibrate at a particular frequency, the natural resonant frequency. So what we're going to talk about today is a simple pendulum, and this is the basis behind a basic musical metronome. All right, it's also the basis behind a grandfather clock, and we kind of all know what a pendulum is, right? You can simply imagine like a string like I have here with a weight on it, a mass, and this thing just swings back and forth, right, at a predetermined rate. Think of a swing set, okay? So you sit there and you kind of push, and you have an input, right? Maybe somebody initially gives you a push, and as this thing travels across, right, at some end point, that energy of motion is sort of exhausted, if you will, and gravity pulls on this, brings it back, so it accelerates back down, but there is uh, inertia, it goes through the uh, central hanging point and continues back on up, and here it gains potential energy. So we're going back and forth between potential energy, kinetic energy, in other words, energy of position, that's potential energy, and energy of motion, kinetic energy. So it's just trading these back and forth, back and forth, and if there's no loss in the system, if there's no air friction, if there's no friction up here at the at the pivot point, then this thing would go on forever, basically. Of course, if you've ever been on a swing, you know that's not true, right? You know, there is air friction, there is friction on the pivots and so forth, and eventually this thing will die out. But there is a natural frequency at which this thing wants to vibrate. In other words, the rate at which it goes back and forth. What is that period? What is that frequency? Well, what are the things that might go into this, right? What are the factors that you might consider? Well, just throwing some things out there that you think might be possible. Well, maybe this mass, right? Maybe that has something to do with it. Maybe the length of this has something to do with it, right? How long is this thing? Um, you know, there might be secondary effects, but immediately off the top of your head, those are the things that you might consider. Well, it turns out that what's really important here, you know, because we are talking, after all, about you know, gravity taking effect on this, the acceleration due to gravity is a factor. It also turns out that length of the pendulum is a factor, and mass is not a factor. So the frequency of a simple pendulum for relatively short angles, and by relatively short angles I'm talking maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 degrees of, of swing, right? not huge swings, Okay, but you know, relatively modest sort of swings like that. The frequency is found as 1 over 2 pi. Right? Remember, pi is the mathematical constant, which is approximately equal to uh, 3.14159. It's an irrational number, but you can think of 1 over 2 pi, that constant, is being approximately 0.159. So you can just mentally just replace that with a number. 0.159. And then this is multiplied by the square root of g, the gravitational constant, divided by the length of the pendulum arm. All right, so on good old planet Earth here, g in metric units is 9.8 meters per second squared. And of course, l will be measured in meters. Okay, and this will give you the natural resonant frequency of this pendulum. So what we see is, since we're not going to change g, right, um, unless you want to bring this on the moon or someplace like that, but on Earth, right, g is fixed, unless you're you know, like way up a mountain or something like that, but basically g is fixed, and we can play with l. And what we see here is that the bigger l is, the longer this arm, the pendulum arm is, Right, we're dividing by a bigger and bigger number. That gives us a smaller and smaller value here. In other words, 
a slower and slower rate of change. Uh, a quick approximation, right? I mentioned at the beginning that this is uh, the basis for something like a grandfather clock. So if you made the arm on a grandfather clock, you know, grandfather clocks are pretty tall, right? And they have this rather long arm with a weight in the center. Um, it turns out that's about a meter, not exactly, but it's pretty close to a meter in length. And if you plug that in here, you have 9.8 meters, right, uh, per second squared for the acceleration, a length of one, so that 9.8 over one is 9.8, right? Take the square root of 9.8, it's a little over three, just a little over three. I'm just doing an approximation here. And of course, one over two pi. So I multiply that by three, in other words, uh, 3 over 2 pi, and pi is a little over 3, as I said, so the 3s just about cancel out, and you're left with a frequency of half a hertz. In other words, on a grandfather clock, the natural resonant frequency is, is 2 seconds, 0.5 hertz, right? 1 over 0.5 hertz is 2 seconds, to go from the starting point to the other side and back, right? So basically, tick is 1 second, tock is another second. Tick, tock, tick, tock. And there's your full cycle. And if you were to map that out, you'd get something that looks fairly sinusoidal, right? So that's sort of the, the uh, basic construction of a grandfather clock. That arm has to be um, about a meter long. Now, you can play with that. You can gear it. You can make it shorter like in a cuckoo clock and maybe have this, instead of being half a hertz, you could have it be one hertz, right? So... You know, down and back is one second rather than down is a second and back is a second. You could do that too, shorten that thing up. Um, but that's, that is the basic operation of it. Now, at this point, I want to bring out something that's sort of a common error that people fall into. And that's the idea of systems being linear versus nonlinear, non -linear, right? So linearity or linear systems versus Nonlinearity, nonlinear systems. Now, very often people learn in, in school in a math class about proportionality. They assume everything is proportional. And by proportional, what we mean is if there's a change in an input variable, then we get that same kind of change, that same factor of change in the output variable. So if I was talking about you know, a home stereo amplifier, a car stereo amplifier, and we double the input voltage to it, then we expect the output voltage, in other words, going to the loudspeaker, would also double. If I increase it by a factor of three, then the output increases by a factor of three. If I decrease the input by a factor of 10, the output decreases by a factor of 10. That's what we refer to as a strict proportionality, a linear system. Lots of things in nature are not linear. This is an example, right? The square root basically says, hey, this is not a linear relationship. If it was a linear relationship, then we would find that whatever the change in the length is, we would see a similar sort of change in f. In other words, if I were to change the length by a factor of two, the natural frequency would change by a factor of two. But that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, if we want to change a factor of two in f, we have to change L by a factor of four because we're taking the square root, right? So the square root of four is two, and that's where our factor of two would come in. So, you know, this is a, a sort of a common thing, a common trap that people fall into. You know, another sort of related trap is sort of an assumption that the size of something in a system is proportional to its contribution. Things that are really small don't have much of a contribution. Right? It's only the, like the big things, the big parts that really make a difference. And in some systems, that's very true. But there are many, many examples where that is not true. Something can be very, very small, and yet its overall impact can be huge. So one example of that would be the atmosphere. You know, most of the atmosphere is nitrogen and then oxygen. That takes up the vast majority. And then we have much smaller percentages of, of trace gases. For example... Uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, makes up about 400 parts per million of the total atmosphere. And people would say, oh, that's tiny. You know, it's, it's less than a tenth of a percent. How can that really have any impact on the 
you know, the overall operation of the atmosphere, right? And what's going on there? Well, it turns out that relatively small thing, because it's not a simple linear system, can have a huge effect. That's what greenhouse gases are all about. If you don't believe that, just compare Mercury, the planet Mercury, and the planet Venus. Mercury is much closer to the sun, but current data reveals that Venus is actually hotter than Mercury is, even though Mercury is closer to the sun. Why? Because of a runaway greenhouse effect on the planet Venus. Put a finer point on this, if you could somehow major, you know, wave a magic wand and change all of the CO2 that's in the Earth's atmosphere, just snap your fingers, and have it all turn into hydrogen sulfide, in a matter of minutes, every human on the planet would be dead. Yet, it's this tiny fraction of 1%. But the system is not linear, right? Things don't sort of balance out that way. So this is something that we see here. It's something we're going to see again. Many, many systems are not linear in their relation, right? It's not a simple proportion. So that's what we see with the length of our pendulum. So I have a little demo for you. Got some cheesy little pendulums, and you can do this at home. So all I have here is a nut, okay? I just happen to color it red so you can see it a little bit better, hanging from a string. And then next to it, I have two nuts, identical nuts, but I have two of them, colored blue, okay? And twice the mass, our equation up here says, hey, mass doesn't make a difference, right? As a matter of fact, I'm going to get rid of this background so it's just a nice pure white background, all right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set these to the same exact length because it should be the length that determines this. Obviously, the gravitational attraction on these two things is going to be identical. So I'm going to turn this toward the camera so that you can see these things swing back and forth. Now, if this is true, if mass does not make a difference and it's really just the length, then these two things should swing back and forth at the same rate. I don't really care what that rate is right now. I just want to verify conceptually what's going on with this equation. All right. So let me see if these guys are lined up. And they are pretty close. All right. Oh, I'm not going to sit here and tweeze this thing until it's perfect. But so I'm just going to take these and let go. And we'll see if they swing at basically the same rate. Remember, the blue one toward the camera is twice, as the, ma twice the mass as the red one, which is closer to the board. Okay, so we can see, yeah, these things are swinging at the same rate. Okay, twice the mass. Now, I'm going to get rid of this little guy, because the other half of this is the length. And so that I don't confuse anything, right, so that I don't sit here and um, say, oh, well, you know, I have a different mass. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get another, um, another one of these guys that's just a single it's the one I used earlier, right? Just a single nut, but it is colored blue. Let me tighten this up a little bit. And I'm going to make this guy roughly four times the length that I have for the red one. Why four times? Well, as I said, square root of four is a factor of two. So this one should be going, if I make it four times as long, this one should be going not at one quarter the speed, but at one half the speed. And again, I'm not going to worry about getting this thing perfect. You know, there are certainly little errors with the way, oops, let me line this the other way. So at least the direction of the pivot is the same. Okay. Now let me see how long this is. That's about four and a half inches, so that would be about 18 inches for this guy. And where are we? Okay, so we got to get a little bit more for this. Tighten that up a little bit. And, oh, we need quite a bit. Okay. 
crack that up. And it's still a little bit long. Okay, that's pretty close. Pretty close. Close enough for our purposes. Okay, so if the blue one, being four times as long, right, from the pivot point to the center of the mass, being four times as long, which should be um, a factor of two in terms of its frequency. So the frequency is half the size, the period is twice as long. Right? Remember, period and frequency, it's a reciprocal relation. So here's what should happen. I'm going to let these things go at the same time. So in the amount of time it takes for this to go out to here, the red one should go out and back. And by the time this thing comes back to a starting point, this thing will be able to go out and back again. Right? So that's one full cycle for this and two cycles for this. Right? Out, back, out, back. This just goes out and back. All right? So assuming I measured these halfway decently, let's see what we get. Back. 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 Right? So it actually works. So we know this system is, in fact, behaving according to this equation, right? The mass did not make any difference. It's the length which makes a difference. The longer it is, right, the slower it is, that's the reciprocal part. And we see the square root in that we multiplied this by four, and yet there's only a factor of two change in the frequency of the period. Okay? So, by the way, if you take this off, for those of you who have a little bit more math, what you have is the radian frequency, right? The 1 over 2 pi is just to turn it into a normal cycles per second, hertz, instead of the radian frequency. The ratio between those things is 2 pi. So that's where the 1 over 2 pi comes from, right? And there you have it. A simple harmonic motion example using a pendulum. And like I said, this is the basic idea behind a metronome, right? Get your timing down when you play your instruments. Something like a grandfather clock, but it's basically a resonance system sort of picks out this natural resonant frequency, produces this nice sinusoidal waveform. Well, there are lots of different kinds of, of systems, mechanical systems, that make these sinusoidal waveforms. In the next video, we're going to take a look at tension strings. In other words, the basis behind things like a guitar, a bass, a violin, right? Stringed instruments. Uh, and also, tubes, columns of air. So this is where we get our wind wind uh, instruments and our brass instruments from, right? We'll see that next time. Hope to see you then.